Well, I was excited for Tim, who had just been appointed to one of the most, if not the most, dynamic positions in all of Florida state government. Not only does the general counsel oversee the entire judicial appointment process, the general counsel advises the governor on death warrants, clemency applications, executive orders, and on whether to sign or veto acts of the legislature. The general counsel also is the governor's liaison to Florida's court system, the Florida bar, and the attorney general's office. The general counsel oversees the legal operations and staff attorneys for Florida's dozens of administrative agencies and departments. And if that wasn't enough, as I mentioned before, this general counsel was tasked with heading up negotiations on behalf of the state of Florida with the Seminole Tribe for Florida's gaming compact. So I was very, very excited for my friend Tim when he was appointed. But I also remember that I was very concerned for Tim. Tim has a beautiful wife, three fantastic kids, three dogs, a goat, a cow, two horses, and a goldfish named Elvis. And I know what a huge personal sacrifice it is being general counsel to the governor for the nation's third largest state. I remember asking Tim, who took a significant pay cut, Tim, are you sure you want to do this? Without missing a beat, Tim matter-of-factly responded, when the governor asks you to help out our state, you do it. And that simple answer defines Tim's character, his professionalism, and his dedication to public service far more than any introduction that I could give for my dear friend. So without any further ado, may I introduce to you the general counsel for the governor of the state of Florida, my dear friend, Tim Serio. Thank you all very much. Um, first, uh, Ed, you, you have brought uh, the level of dignity to the third D DCA of a game show host, but nevertheless, I know how beloved you are by your colleagues. I do want to thank Jason Gonzalez um, first for asking Judge Scales to introduce me at this event. Um, and Jason, I look forward to taking a very special interest in any matters you have pending now before <laughs> the executive branch and any of our executive agencies. Judge Scales, Ed, um, thank you for that introduction. Ed, as you all can tell, Ed loves to MC events. Um, his introductions especially are hilarious, wildly inappropriate, <laughs> completely inaccurate, much like his judicial opinions. Um, <laughs> and, I, you know, it's funny, I do remember talking to Ed one day before he got on the bench, and I asked him, you know, Ed, why do you want to be uh, a judge so badly? You've applied to the JNC 43 times. You know, your name's gotten to the governor 17. It just doesn't look good, but you keep doing it. And Ed told me, he said, I, have, I love public policy. I've always wanted to be in the legislature, but when people meet me, I am immediately despised. So why not get appointed and I can legislate from the bench? So I was kind of surprised to see Ed here today, or, but I, I am happy he's here and was invited. But. Um, all kidding aside, as, as Ed mentioned, he is my fraternity brother. He's been my good friend for almost 30 years. He is, he is a great jurist, and he absolutely brings conservative principles to his judging and a philosophy of restraint on the bench. Uh, he's armed with a keen mind and a great sense of humor. Um, I know that in his two years on the bench, he has earned the respect uh, and, and even the friendship of all of his colleagues on the third DCA. And Ed, I know I speak for them when I say you will be sorely missed after your upcoming merit retention election. Um, now, <clears throat> as the governor's general counsel, uh, what I'd like to do, you know, I'd like to make some comments and then at the end take some questions because as Jesse told me, most of our speakers have canceled. So he's asked me to eat up some time, but um, I would like to end with some questions. But, you know, one of the things that I've enjoyed being general counsel, all kidding aside, is the camaraderie with my with uh, folks who've sat in the chair I now occupy. Um, and I don't know how, how many of them are here. I don't know. I don't think Paul Huck is here, is he? Or, or Charlie Trippy or any of those folks. Jesse is obviously here. Jason is here. Um, Jesse's been a great uh, resource for me. Uh, I call him a lot. Actually, more accurately, Jesse calls me. He's not shy about expressing his opinions. Um, and, you know, I was, one time I was going through a very, sort of a very difficult period and I was trying to figure out a, a, a fairly complicated issue. 
and Jesse was very encouraging. He, he truly, he put his arm or his hand on my shoulder and he said, Tim, you really in these times, you've got to rely on a higher power and you need to get in a quiet place and just ask yourself, WWJD, you know, what would Jesse do? So, <laughs> not a humble man, but a good friend nevertheless. <laughs> and, and of course, uh, I would absolutely be remiss if I did not recognize um, that shy and wallflower of a man, Pete Antonacci. Pete, it, it, it is almost one o'clock. How many people will be fired today? I'm just curious. <laughs> Where is Pete? Um, no, Pete is, Pete is a great resource for me. As some of you have asked me at this conference about the upcoming um, Constitutional Revision Commission, and as you know, it only meets every 20 years, and I have the benefit of Pete's experience. He's been through seven of them, so <laughs> it's, it, it's really good to have him here. Um, now, uh, uh, enough uh, hilarity. Um, you know, people really want to know why or what the governor looks for uh, in a judicial appointment. What, what is he interested in? What matters to him? And, and he said it before. I think most of you in this room probably know, and it may seem like a trite answer, but it's absolutely accurate. He will say he wants to know that uh, his appointees understand a very simple concept. The governor doesn't get to make the law, and neither do his judicial appointees. It's basic civics, and that they understand separation of powers. And he also wants to make sure that his judicial appointees understand humility. And that's very, very important to the governor. So having said that, let me, I'm gonna take off my general counsel hat, and now this is, this is what I would like to talk about is humility and how, how I tend to look at it, and I think some of the folks on my staff in our office look at humility. So um, I apologize if this is gonna sound a little preachy, but I, I think it's important. And, and I don't mean false humility or humility in the sense of having some quaint or, or, or you know, trite concept of being courteous to others, but I mean humility in the sense of a judge somberly grasping the awesome responsibility and power and duty that they've been clothed with. And that if a judge wields that authority without the utmost care, it can just cause irrevocable damage to property, liberty, and life. And it's humility um, that helps a judge remember that we live in a constitutional republic, that there are three branches of government, and that it is not the job of the jurist to do the job of the other two, even if he or she does not like the outcome that the law dictates. You know, Thomas More called humility that low sweet root from which all heavenly virtues shoot. Um, C.S. Lewis said that humility is not thinking less of yourself, it is thinking of yourself less. And perhaps most profoundly, Yogi Berra observed, it ain't the heat, it's the humility. Wow, I thought that would go over, <laughs> when I rehearsed it, I really thought that would get over, go over better. Um, but, but, it, but it is a real, it, humility really does impact I think one's outlook on the job of judging. Humility, I believe, true humility humility, can lead to accountability, but also bold fidelity to the law. I believe that when we exercise humility and think of ourselves less, it is easier to have faith in the process and in other institutions. This is particularly true for judges. It is easier to maintain fidelity and accountability to the rule of law. It's easier to resist the allure of politics and an outcome-based judging. Uh, to understand that he or she has not been appointed or elected to serve as a super legislature or agent for social change. Um, and I love, I think most of you probably heard this, but I love the, you know, the, the exchange between Judge Learned Hand and, and Justice Holmes. Most of you have heard it again when they, they've had lunch and Justice Holmes is riding off in his carriage and Learned Hand supposedly ran after him and said, do justice, sir, do justice. And Holmes stopped the carriage and reproved Hand, saying it is not my job or that is not my job, it is my job to apply the law. And it really is a bit frightening to think how novel that concept has become in the American public and even in our law schools. Um, I was at an event a few years ago and Justice Thomas uh, had spoken at the event and um, he was relaying a story after he spoke about uh, an exchange he had with some Ivy League law students. He loves spending time with students. He travels the country. I think he actually is at the University of Florida next week speaking. But he was having an exchange with students at, at an Ivy League school and they were you know, throwing hypotheticals at him. 
And one, one of the students threw out this very sort of um, hypothetical that demanded a result that was you know, very noble sounding, um, but a very progressive outcome. And Justice Thomas uh, said, well, what's my basis of authority? What is my basis of authority for ruling that way? And the student answered, well, I mean, wh what do you mean, Your Honor? You're, you're a Supreme Court judge. That's telling. That's very, very telling. And, and it's frightening, not to overstate, but it is a bit frightening that the public and the media, especially if they like the outcome or maybe even are ambivalent about the out outcome, seem to have bought into the idea that a legislature or the Congress uh, can overreach and act unconstitutionally and a governor or a president can certainly overreach and act unconstitutionally, but not the Supreme Court. That the court is somehow uh, immune from politics or that um, the outcome you know, somehow is, is uh, sacrosanct. And, and I think maybe part of that reason is that our, our system, of, we do certainly have a system of checks and balances, but sometimes those checks on the court are very, very rare. So this is the mentality, I believe, that's come to, you know, come to permeate you know, American jurisprudence. And I, I certainly wouldn't relish our courts uh, or the law itself losing legitimacy, you know, but that is what happens when institutions overreach. Um, we are imperfect human beings. It happens, uh, and we get it wrong. Madison said that the essence of government is power, and power, lodged as it must be in human hands, will ever be, will ever be liable to abuse. And that is true of all three branches of government. Sometimes the abuse is certainly not intentional, but we do get it wrong. So without a sense of humility and awe for the solemn role of the judiciary, a judge, like any public official, I believe, can eventually come to think they are bigger than the position of public trust that they hold. And that can lead to judicial decisions that really aren't confined to the parameters of the text or to established precedent. You know, I've spoken a little bit about humility in the sense of accountability, and that leads to restraint. Um, but there's also, I believe, uh, a type of humility and accountability that can lend itself and must lend itself to boldness as well. And the boldness, to, it's the boldness to make the right judicial decision in the face of opposition and despite what is popular. Uh, public figures make decisions every day only because they are afraid of how the uh, media will treat them or the public outcry that they will face. Um, and judges do face these same pressures. I know I'm, there's a lot of folks in this room who face those pressures every day. But I firmly believe that humble judges realize that the duty they have to be faithful stewards of the law and the sense of duty that can, be, that can imbue one with great boldness in the face of adversity or even public hostility, that can come from having a sense of humility. It's the, it's the responsibility that you have to shoulder. Now, as general counsel, I've had the privilege of being invited to speak at investitures from time to time. It's pretty fun. Sometimes I'm asked to give the invocation. And if I know the judge is a person of faith, uh, there's a couple of passages from the Old Testament that I like to read. And one pertains very, very directly to the idea of being a bold, faithful, and impartial steward of the law, uh, even in the face of adversity. And uh, that passage is De Deuteronomy 1, 16 through 17. Uh, that it was, uh, Moses was speaking to the, uh, to the nation of Israel and he was told by God that he was about to die. And he was reminding the Hebrews how he had appointed from among them judges to hear cases in his stead. And this is what Moses said. And I charged your judges at that time, hear the disputes between your people and judge fairly, whether the cases between two Israelites or between an Israelite and a foreigner residing among you. Do not show partiality in judging. Hear both small and great alike. Do not be afraid of anyone, for judgment belongs to God. And I, I think that the message is clear, administer justice and, and, and apply the law fairly, without partiality, but also without fear of repercussion. And of course, that's not, that's not always easy. The second passage has nothing to do with, the, with that topic, but I think it is equally important and valid, and that is uh, from 2 Kings. It's a story about Elisha. It's 2 Kings 2, 22 through 24. From there, Elisha went up to Bethel. As he was walking along the road, some boys came out of the town and jeered at him. Get out of here, Baldy, they said. Get out of here, Baldy. He turned around, looked at them, and called down a curse on them in the name of the Lord. Then two bears came out of the wood and mauled the boys. 
True story. And the moral of that is do not make fun of bald people either. <laughs> um, very important concept in, in American jurisprudence. So um, to sum up, um, at least my first scripture, or first scripture I mentioned, teaches that we should judge without partiality regardless of the status of the parties. Do not be afraid of, of, of what will come after, public outcry, whether you're tilting in favor on politically, not under the law, of the stronger party or the weaker party because you think of res a, a certain result is proper. Um, that's important, of course. And you know, Judge Bork wrote in The Tempting of America 25 years ago, it's hard to believe it's been 25 years, um, that no legal system can produce increasingly political results without at some point ceasing to be or earning the respect due a legal system. Groups that have been taught to see the courts as their reliable political ally, as their branch of government, react in fury when courts begin to apply law instead. The Supreme Court is our preeminent symbol of the rule of law. If the court comes to seem illegitimate, the legitimacy of law itself declines and the moral obligation to obey it is cast into doubt. And to Judge Bork's point, judges should not consider themselves as political allies of anyone. To do so is, with all due respect, even with the best of intentions, a bit arrogant and dangerous and can uh, erode the legitimacy of our, of our judicial system. Humility, however, I believe can often be uh, the inoculant against that temptation. The kind of humility that promotes a sense of reverence and, and boldness and fidelity to the law. So um, with that said, um, I, you know, when Judge Bork wrote The, the Tempting of America, um, it, had a, it, it did have a major impact on the development of the law. And, and we can be disheartened from time to time on seeing some of the, the opinions that come out of our nations and our state's highest courts, but somebody made the point yesterday about Justice Scalia whether you're talking about Scalia's opinions or writings or, or Judge Bork's writings, some of the opinions of judges in this room, um, you have made a difference. You have, not just with um, the, the judges, the lawyers, the law students, even the general public now. There's a, there's a, there, is, there are many who understand that, law, that um, the, or excuse me, there are many who understand the importance the supreme importance of adherence to the text and the plain meaning of the law. So thank you for all that you do to the Federalist Society. Sorry if I droned on a little bit, but I'd love to answer any questions that you all may have. We got lots of time, hit me, it's fine. No, Ed, you don't get to ask a question. <laughs> Anybody? Come on. Yes, ma'am. What is your background in your career with Justin and Ed O'Rourke and who helped you in the job you're in now? That's a good question. I, I would say um, I got a taste of it um, when I was general counsel to the Department of Health under Governor Bush. We had, we had political issues that would crop up and complex legal issues. and. You know, managing lawyers, um, sometimes cri you know crises, or in having to deal with you know a, an agency crisis where you're reading about it in the paper, doesn't hold a candle to the job I have now. But, but it gave me a flavor. And operating as a lawyer, and, and so many people in this room, you know Jesse, Jason, Pete. I mean, you all know it's very, very different when your client uh, is a major public official because the advice you have to give certainly needs to be legally sound. But the answer is rarely no. It's how do we get to yes? How do we how do we do how do we get to yes lawfully, and if possible, you know, with the best you know with the best perception for the public. All right, Ed. Since nobody else is asking, what was your question? Uh, tell us a little bit about the Seminole Bingo or the Seminole uh, negotiation. Oh, um, so the Seminole Tribe, as you may know, a compact was signed in in uh, 2010, and there was a provision. Uh, for bank card games that expired. And so um, beginning in, I guess, Pete, tell me if I'm wrong, I guess beginning in 14, um, there were attempts at renegotiating that compact. Um, uh, there was not a legislative appetite at the time. Uh, we re-engaged re with the tribe uh, in early, well, probably summer of 2015. And 
what we hammered out was, we believe, a very, very good agreement, a very good agreement for the state of Florida. Uh, it, the guarantee, the Seminoles are guaranteeing a revenue share to the state of $3 billion. Uh, that is unprecedented. Um, we think it's a good deal, but the governor's position has been um, the, the tribe did what I asked them to do. I think that, and then I'm speaking as the governor, I've cut a great deal for the people of the state of Florida. I think it's good for the state, but he respects the process. It is now in the hands of the legislature. If the House and Senate want to pass it, if they don't, I mean, that is that is their prerogative, and we absolutely respect that role. There are a lot of issues going on right now, and there are a lot of things that the state of Florida is facing and dealing with, and, and the compact is an important one, but it is one. So. Other questions? Oh gosh, Adam? I'm kidding, Adam. <sighs> That's a very, very good question. It, it's, you know, it's sort of, you know, sometimes it's like faith. Some people have a big, you know, epiphany and others it just sort of develops gradually. I think mine is the latter. Um, although I, I think I'm pretty good at seeing the other side. I just, I've always had um, pretty conservative core principles. Um, there, there was never a, there wasn't that epiphany moment for me. Um, going to law school, uh, where it gets, you know, where those, where those perceptions are challenged or where you, you know, getting angry at a law professor because you may, you may I, I may have perceived, perhaps incorrectly, but probably not, that they had, that they were, um, you know, maybe maybe twisting a principle or ignoring something that was clear in a statute uh, for an outcome. Certainly, taking uh, constitutional law and learning about the various theories of legal interpretation was pretty eye-opening. Probably. Yes, ma'am. You can be told how intense the job is, but, and I, and I don't mean to sound whiny, I really don't. I mean, it is, it is the best job, and this is kind of depressing, it is the best job I believe I will ever have, legal job. Um, it is the most exciting legal job I will ever have. My, my boss is not only, as you all know, a great businessman, but he is a great lawyer and built a heck of a practice um, before he decided to, uh, to get into the business side. But um, I, I just, you know, you can't fathom the intensity. I mean, that, that was probably it. And, it. and it's one of those things that you, over, over time, maybe weeks or, or maybe months, you just you start to you get used to operating in that high pressure environment. I think the best piece of advice I received, I was, it was probably week three on the job, and one of, one of the 23-year-old staffers was in, was in the office, and she looked at me and said, well, Mr. Serio, how are you doing? And I said, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm hanging in there. It's going okay. And she said, well, the easiest thing is when you just realize that every day there's going to be a crisis, and that's okay. It makes the job a lot easier. Best piece of advice I got. She was absolutely right. Absolutely right. Yes. I, I'm, I'm certainly proud of, of the compact just because as a document, just negotiating with the tribe, we, we got a lot. However, and I know this is going to sound corny with this audience, but I think, I, I think our judicial appointments. I, I think that if you ask the governor, as much as the governor talks about jobs, he will say that his, his greatest legacy will be his appointments to the bench. And so I'm just you know, fortunate that I get to share in that with Pete, with Jesse, and with Charlie. Trippy. Um, I'm, I'm very, very proud of that. And, and again, it doesn't mean we always get it right. The governor doesn't always get it right. Ed is an example. <laughs> but, but you do your best. And for those of you who, you know, if you're interested in applying or if you have applied, stick with it. Don't give up. You, there are people, there are great members of the judiciary who had to apply multiple times. Um, and certainly, but though, if you're interested in circuit or county court, don't be afraid to run. Don't be afraid of the political process. I mean, it's, it's really, really intimidating and it's gutsy, but to be able to stand up and stand for election, um, that's pretty impressive too. I wouldn't discount it, explore it. Yes, Jason. Can you tell us a little bit about the other attorneys who worked for you in the governor's office and what role did they play? 
no, I'd rather take all the credit. <laughs> um, so, Heather, are you, are you in the room? Heather Stearns, will you stand up? Turn around, spin. <laughs> Heather is my deputy general counsel. She does a fantastic job. She has a primarily, you know, what we'll do is we'll divide up the office and uh, based on certain state agencies. Heather, what, what, just yell out, what, what are the agencies that you deal with? Department of Children and Families, the ones that are low-key, nothing ever happens there, yeah. <laughs> the easy ones. Um, and all of them, Heather included, help, help with the judicial appointments, the interviewing, the vetting. Ben, are you here? You can stand up. What do you, tell the, uh, the group what your agencies are. That's right. Good answer. Uh, John, John MacGyver. John is our head of the uh, Office of Fiscal Accountability and Regulatory Reform and the agencies you have, law enforcement related. That's uh, Fish and Wildlife and uh, we always use these, you know, our, our abbreviations. We, we, that's, that's bad form in Tallahassee. We get used to that. We shouldn't do that. I do it all the time. And that's it. That's only, oh, you were the only three that made it, right? Who else is, anybody else here? No? So that's it, we, we, we divide up the duties. Oh, I thought, am I getting the hook? All right, never mind. Good night, everybody. No, <laughs> one more question? All right, thank you all very much. This was a lot of fun.